This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Let's talk about this, okay? What happens is this. Mary is engaged to Joseph. Now, it's totally different than the way we do in Canada. When you got engaged to Joseph, it was a contractual agreement between the parents and the families and everything like this, and it really was legally binding. And the point is, later on there would be a marriage ceremony, and then you could consummate the wedding and all this stuff. So Joseph and Mary are engaged, but legally, contractually together. So later on in this story, you're going to hear that Joseph thought about divorcing. And it was because the fact is this, the, the contractual agreement started with engagement. Now watch this. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to the public disgrace. And we're talking the Old Testament law. He had in mind to divorce her quietly. Remember, I just talked to you about this. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said to him, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit, and she will give birth to a son, and you will give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sin." All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin conceive and give forth a birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God's with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord commanded him and took Mary home as wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to Jesus, and he gave him the name Jesus. Okay, watch this. We have two problems, and these are incredibly big problems. Number one is what Joseph was going through and what Mary's going through. Mary has an angel of the Lord come to her and talk to her while she's awake, whereas Joseph has an angel of the Lord come to him and talk to him while he's asleep. Now, theologians, I was trying to figure out why, why did God do it this way? Well, Mary had a softer heart towards God, and Mary could deal with an angel, whereas Joseph, and the angel showed up to Joseph when he's awake, and a lot of theologians believe this, Joseph probably would have run. So God had to speak through Joseph in a dream with an angel because it would have been easier for him because he probably would not have run. The point is this, Joseph grew up as a devoted believer from the Old Testament Jewish religion. And the fact is he knew all the things, you know, you get engaged, it's contractual, stuff like this, but you don't touch her until the wedding day, and she doesn't touch you until the wedding day, and stuff like this. Well, Mary comes to Joseph and says, yo, you know what, guess what, I'm having a baby, I'm pregnant, da, 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 and it's from the Holy Spirit. Well, notice what it says, he considered divorcing her. Divorce meant back then that he would be able to send her away quietly. There's, there's a couple things you could have done. You could have stoned her to death. You could have publicly disgraced her. But he decided to quietly send her away because he knew that this child was not his. He has a major problem. The Mary, she has a tremendous problem too because the fact is this. She needs Joseph to help her with Jesus. And so she needs God to intervene in this situation. Well, let me take you to point number one, and all of them start with the letter C, correction. Um, I don't like this word. I hate being corrected. Uh, ask my better half, um, and she does it in a beautiful way. She's very gentle, she's very kind. Like the Bible says in Galatians, gently restore your brother or correct your brother. But I've never liked correcting. I never liked my parents correcting. I didn't like teachers correcting me. I, I'm, uh, you know, it, somebody says it's a man thing. No, you know, I've met a lot of ladies who don't like correction either. God had to come and correct Joseph. You know, um, my wife, she sails this boat and she races and, and I'm very proud of her. Um, the point is this, that when I go out with her, which is only once in a blue moon, I never race with her, she's always looking to where is the wind coming from? What are the waves doing? What are the other racers doing? And stuff like this. And she's always correcting her course in order to win the race. If you don't correct your course, you could lose the wind or you could bump into a boat or the wind, the waves could. And the point is this, as a sailor, she's always looking to correct so she could win. 
Sometimes we are stubborn mules. We're pig-headed. We, we are too old to correct. I, I heard one person says, I'm too old to, to correct. You know, give me a break. As long as you're breathing, God wants to help you correct. And what happens is Joseph is asleep, okay? And God comes to him and says, look, I need to correct you. I know you, you're a good Jewish boy, you're following the Old Testament, da, 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 but the Old Testament also talks about the Messiah being born of a virgin, stuff like this. You've got to bring all of this in. It's time to correct you. And all of a sudden, Joseph, he wakes up and he realizes that he is called of God. And instead of his way and his highway, he goes God's way and God's highway. He never knows about the future. He does, God doesn't say, and by the way, when you get to Bethlehem, I'll put you in the most luxurious room in the, in the hotel. No, he doesn't know about the manger and being in the cave where the animals are and, and no room in the inn. He doesn't know about having to flee to Egypt and he doesn't know all about this stuff. But he is willing to be corrected. My heart hurts today because how many times has God wanted to correct me so that he could bring blessing? Did you hear this? When you go with God's correction, you get blessing. I remember graduating from uh, graduate school and I had a master's, a double major, biblical study and also television. And I was going to go with a large television news corporation, one of the top three in the United States. And they were going to take me on staff and just coming out of grad school and going with them, I was going to travel 75,000 US dollars. Canadian dollar was valued at 64 cents. Think about this. God said to me, you go with 100 Huntley Street, which is a television program, Christian TV program here in Toronto. And I said, Lord, are you crazy? I said, 75,000 US dollars. And this organization was going to pay me 13,500. And later on, they gave me a pay raise to 15,400. And Canadian dollars at 64%. I said, Lord, this doesn't make sense. Yet the Lord wanted to correct me, correct my path. See, a lot of times when God corrects you, it doesn't make sense. Mary is pregnant with a baby from the Holy Spirit, it doesn't make sense. Yes, the Old Testament, but not, not in, you know, I'm just a normal carpenter, Joseph says. Correction. But, but here, here's the craziest part. Correction without change, the second C, is not correction. See, God wants to correct us, but he needs you and I to change. Romans chapter 12. Present your body as a living sacrifice holy and pleasing unto God. Do not be conformed to the patterns of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How do I know I have a new mind? I am not only listening for the correction, but I'm changing. The older I get, the harder it is to change. The more I get comfortable in my way. And yet for some of us oldie goldies, it's time to have correction so we can change, so we can bless generations to come after we are not here. And all of a sudden, I, I realize that God is calling us to be like Joseph, where, yes, you have all your plans in place, but sometimes you've got to throw them in the toilet and just go with what God wants. Can you imagine? Jesus is born in Bethlehem, in, in a stall for animal, in a manger, no room in the inn. And then the next thing you know, Jesus is running with Joseph and Mary to Egypt, of all places. Sometimes change isn't the way we think. James chapter 1 says, Consider pure joy when you face trials of many kind, because it's pers making you persevere so you will become mature and complete. Joseph, guess what? There are trials of many kind. Be joyful because God is using you. Now, sometimes when you're going through this change, it doesn't look like God's using me, and it doesn't look like it's great, but when you look back, it's like, wow, that's amazing. Watch this. One of my friends has a PhD. He's a professor in one of the universities here in Canada. Tremendous brain, tall, handsome, brilliant Christian guy. Um, and, and for years, he never got married. And, and he kept saying, I'm looking for God's will. I, I just haven't found God's will. Now, it wasn't he was picky or anything. I mean, he's a professor in university. He, he just wanted God's will. One day in church, there's a lady sitting just over from him. And 
he shook her hand when the pastor said, turn to somebody and shake your hands. This is before COVID-19. He shook her hand and eventually they got married. And he said to me, you know, I'm so glad I went with what God wanted, not what I wanted. I'm sure if Joseph was here today, he would say, let me tell you what I planned, but how God changed so that I could do his will. Let, let me take you to the sec, third C. It says control. Romans 12, it's not my control, it's his control. I mean, present your body as a living sacrifice. Here, here's the truth. The fruit of the Spirit, one of the fruits of the Spirit is self-control. Love, gentleness, patience, kindness, self-control. My self-control is not really myself, but God's control in me. It's not my way, it's his way. And, and, and what happens is Joseph shows us this. He, I mean, he, he is planning to get rid of Mary. He's planning to move on with his life. It just didn't work out. But God all of a sudden says, I not only want you to change, but I want you to give your control to me. Now, I want to speak to the men. Let me just share this with you. And I say this to, maybe you're not like this as a man, but I am pig-headed. I am stubborn. Now, for all you women who just said amen, just so you know, maybe you are too. But we need to come to a place in our lives where it's not our control, but it's God's control. And I've learned this so many times in my life where it's not my way, but it's God's way. Let me give you an illustration of this. When it comes to persecuted church, in November I heard uh, from the Lord, we should raise $100,000 for a persecuted church. PayPal, have you ever tried to raise money for anything during COVID-19? People are unemployed. People are going through hard times. People are, I mean, the, 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 who in their right mind would raise money during COVID-19 for some? I mean, barely you're trying to keep a church going. Yet Lord said, hey, I can do all things through you if you let me be your strength. So I come and I tell everybody, hey, guess what? We're raising 100,000 for persecuted church before the end of December. No, only around 28,000 has come in so far. And we're far away, and I've only got around two or three weeks left. But the point is this, I'm believing God that God's people will help me raise. And if you want to financially help us raise, just go online, do a donation, and put persecuted church, or just put church. And 100%, not 99, we don't take a fee like some other organization. And, and here's the beautiful part. We're giving to two organizations, Voice of the Martyrs and Open Door Canada. These are the orphans. Remember I was talking to you about um, a couple of weeks ago, we helped build this orphanage in Asia. There are the 90 kids. Now listen to me. Are you ready? All 90 kids, their parents have been martyred for the gospel of Jesus Christ. All 90 kids. And all those kids are in that beautiful building, bedrooms, cafeteria, classrooms, play area, security guards, fences, everything. They're protected. And we've had the opportunity, and this is what we're doing. We're reaching out to the persecutors. And by the end of December, I want to be able to raise 100000 with your help, and I need you desperately. But let me take you to this, okay? My control was no way, Lord, but God's control is, hey, Billy, change. I mean, you need to be corrected. God's people need to give those kids and the persecuted church overseas. And we're giving two great organizations, Voice of the Martyr and Open Door Canada. I mean, it's, you can't get any better. So, so what happens is this. You have correction. But if you don't have change, correction is totally useless. And then you have this incredible change that leads to you giving up your control and going with God to you know, present yourself as a living sacrifice. But then the last one I give to you, and I love this, is character. Suffering through God brings character. Consider pure joy when you face many kinds. Now, let me read this from Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into his grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our suffering. We glory in our suffering. 
because we know that the suffering produces perseverance, perseverance in God produces character, and character produces hope. What character is God producing? He's producing Christ in us. Dying on the cross was his suffering and he persevered and the character of Christ is in us. And when we have the character in Christ in us, what does it say? It will produce hope. And hope and faith are the same thing and we'll move the mountains. I I end with this and I, I love this because the fact is this, God wants to give you correction and God wants you to change and God wants you to give your control to him so he can have his control in you. Why? So you can have the character of Christ. And when we present ourselves as a living sacrifice, what we're saying is I want Jesus to live in me and I want Jesus to be in me. And Joseph, what he did was he gave up his control and he wanted the character of God, Jehovah, to be upon him. I love this, I love this because this touches me, touches my heart. There's a guy in the New Testament, his name's Peter, disciple of Jesus. Before the cross, he denies Christ three times. After the cross, he gets filled with the Holy Spirit. Then the Holy Spirit, when he fills Peter, all of a sudden starts correcting him, starts changing him. All of a sudden, instead of Peter controlling his tongue, the Holy Spirit controls his tongue. And on the day of Pentecost, he gets out there and he starts to preach. And he's so filled with Holy Spirit, he starts preaching. And these, these are the people he denied Christ to three times. But now he's preaching boldness. And what you see is the change in him and the character. I don't want the character of Billy. I want the character of Christ. And you see the character of Christ in Peter. Well, today I want to be transparent with you, and I guarantee you there's going to be tons of emails. And if you don't like this illustration, well, I don't know what to say to you. I grew up in a Pentecost church, my parents and I, we loved each other. My parents are not anti-Roman Catholic. But in our church, if you were Catholic, you weren't a Christian. It's just the way it was. We were taught this in Sunday school um, because they had confession box and Mary and all this stuff. Uh, Catholics aren't Christians. This is what we grew up. Now pay attention. I went through graduate school, I graduated, I started working for an organization called 100 Huntley Street. It's a Christian television program here in Toronto. There's this guy running around the studio who's a Catholic priest named Bob McDougall. And Bob McDougall, a Catholic, and he's working there, and he's telling everybody about loving Jesus and all this stuff, and he's on TV and all this, and I'm going, this just doesn't add up, he's a Catholic, and And I grew up, you know, Catholics aren't Christians. And all of a sudden, Bob knew that I was, um, how do you put it nicely, anti-Christian Catholic or whatever. And one one day we're eating lunch and he said to me, Billy, I want to take you to prayer meeting. And I said, sure, why not? So I went to a prayer meeting at a Catholic church. Can you imagine? I'm stretched. And in the back room of the Catholic Church, there's a room around 35 feet by 35 feet. I walk in, and all, oh, there's a big circle, and everybody was dressed in black, and it was all nuns and priests, and there was only two chairs left, one for Bob and one for me. And Bob said, Billy, go sit down. And I'm sitting, and on the left side, I still remember this Catholic nun, and on this right side is this Catholic priest, and Bob says, let's start to pray. Nobody's preaching, nobody does three-point sermon, nobody does songs, they just start praying. And all of a sudden, the nun just starts to cry unto Jesus. I don't hear Mary, I don't hear anything, I just hear Jesus, Jesus, and just starts crying. And then I listen to the priest, and he's speaking in tongues, and I'm freaking out. And I look around the room, and the room is just filled with the glory of God and the Holy Spirit. And all of a sudden, I realize... God has me there for correction. Now, there's, there's a choice. I could have heard the, or seen the correction of God and just ignored it like a lot of us do, or I could have gone with it and changed. And all of a sudden, I had to throw this control that I was brought up, not from my family, but from the church, out the door 
and realize that, you know what? There are Catholics who are Christian and there are Catholics who are not Christian. There are Pentecostals who are Christian and there are Pentecostals who are not Christians. And yes, I don't agree with them theologically on the Mary stuff and, and a bunch of other stuff, but the fact is this, God opened my eyes that day to see that there are people who love Jesus and he is Lord, and they're Catholics. And all of a sudden, God had to humble me. And all of a sudden, my character stopped being like Billy and started being more like Jesus. You know why? When Jesus looks at a person, he doesn't look at, oh, you're Catholic, or you're Pentecostal, or you're Anglican, or, or you're, you're Canadian, or you're European, or you're Asian, or you're African. God looks on your heart, not your outward appearance. No, he doesn't see you tall or skinny or, or whatever. He looks at your heart. And it's time you and I started looking at our hearts. It's time you and I started to check our hearts. Are, are we doing what God wants? I mean, when you're in a sailboat and the wind is blowing a certain way and waves are going, and there's obstacles in front of you, are you going to win the race or are you going to lose it because you're stubborn and you're not going to change? Or are you going to be a winner? I, I say this in all love. Joseph teaches me. Yeah, he had a career and he probably had a house and, and he's willing to trade it all in to do what Jehovah wants him to do. I am so stubborn sometimes and I need to give it to Jesus and ask him not only forgive, I need him to correct me I need him to change me through his Holy Spirit. And yes, I need to work with the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit will never change me unless I work with him. But when he changes me and when he corrects me, then I need to have his control, not my control. And when I have his control, then all of a sudden I start to take on the character of Christ. <laughs> I am so sorry for some of you Catholics that I have put down. And I am so sorry for being arrogant and not seeing you the way Jesus sees you from the heart. I want you to know today that God is calling us to be like Joseph. Listen. You might have the next 10 years organized. You might have the next 20 years organized. You know, you might say, it's my way. No. Present your body as a living sacrifice. It's God's way. Oh, I, I, I went to Huntley Street, and then God all of a sudden turns around and sends me to Edmonton to go into pastoring. Can you imagine? The worst thing I could have done, I thought, be a pastor, what the lowest, and yet it turned out to be the best thing. I found my wife in Edmonton, and then all of a sudden I turned around and started pastoring, and God started to use me. I'll be truthful with you, I never planned my life the way it is. But when you go with God, Joseph taught us, God's way is the best way. <laughs>